Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson and I'm the Millbank Family Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Uh, one of the things I do here is to uh, chair meetings of the Hoover History Working Group. And this week we've been extremely fortunate uh, to welcome as our guest presenter, Ian Miller, Assistant Professor of History at St. John's University in New York. Ian started his academic career at Swarthmore, did his master's and PhD in Chinese history at Harvard, and has also spent time as a fellow at, at Yale. He's the author of an exciting new book, Fur, an Empire, F-I-R, that is, The Transformation of Forests in Early Modern China, just out with the University of Washington Press. He's also worked on medieval uh, dairy farming all the way back to the 12th century and has a, an exciting paper coming out on 19th century Chinese crises. So Ian is without question somebody who covers the long durée, as uh, the French historians call it, of Chinese history. Ian, welcome. And uh, let me start by asking a, a very straightforward question. How do forests fit into the long run of Chinese history? Yes, uh, thanks so much, Neil. So the, um, you know, forests play, I think, an often overlooked part in the development of a lot of early modern countries, and China is no exception. And one of the stories that I'm trying to tell in my book is about the replacement of what were largely natural growth mixed forests uh, that were treated as a type of open access common resource with largely purpose grown plantations of fir, um, that's F-I-R, and a handful, of other, a handful of other species oriented towards commercial markets. And so in, in China, this transition starts around 1150 and, um, and advances through 1600 and continues even, um, even thereafter as the development of practices of plantation forestry um, based around, largely around private contracts between um, small scale private forest owners spreads outward um, from a few core locations to cover much of the mountains of Southern China. And this is a new view because uh, Mark Elvin and others have argued for many years that the story was really one of deforestation over centuries. Uh, and you're actually telling us that, no, there was a period of, of reforestation, of, of commercial tree planting that other historians had missed. It's quite a big thing to miss, uh, isn't it? And how did you how do you spot this uh, this uh, forgotten reforestation? So that's absolutely true. Um, and before my book, the the story of Chinese forests was largely one of their removal. And this, I found this idea very provocative, but also it struck me as um, a little bit confusing that China could continue to, to develop for such a long time without forest resources, because forest resources are so important to people's everyday life, especially before the development of things like coal and other fossil fuels. And so I set out looking for them. And in contrast to Europe and North America and a lot of the colonies and former colonies of, um, of Europe, uh, especially in South and Southeast Asia, there was not a centralized forestry bureau in China. And so there's not a single box of documents that you can go into the archive and pull out and, um, and find the material related to forestry. And so largely what I did was I discovered that there was one particular tree, which is very important to the economy, uh, to the forest economy in Southern China. And this is the China fir, Cunninghamia lanceolata. It's actually not a true fir, um, but it's um, similar in its growth characteristics to firs. And um, I discovered this was an incredibly important tree. It's used for everything from coffins to building houses, to building ships, uh, dikes and dams. Uh, and so I started following this tree through the archive and it turned up in a whole manner of 
unexpected places, um, including in the shipyards. Well, I guess that was not so unexpected. Um, but I also discovered that there was a regional forest bureaucracy that I had um, not anticipated. Uh, and also, in particular, it turned up in literally thousands of contracts between individual forest owners. And so I realized that the story of the development of forestry and the replacement of these natural forests with human planted forests was largely not a story of the state in China and more a story of um, private commercially oriented forest owners. And this is quite a surprise because in Europe, the pattern was uh, distinctly different uh, as you implied. Uh, uh, countries, um, I'm thinking of, of Prussia, but there were others, uh, and some Asian countries too, had a centralized state uh, forestry uh, department, uh, or they imported wood. And it's hard to think of another uh, country that had a kind of uh, Chicago economics department approach where it was left to the private sector uh, and the government essentially provided a system of registration and contract enforcement. Uh, and maybe this explains, uh, as you just suggested, why historians overlooked it. Now, how did this work in practice? Because this is so very different from the kind of things uh, European historians are, are familiar with that uh, I struggled a bit at first to kind of conceive of the arrangement. Walk, walk us through how uh, a, a patch of land in, uh, in, on a Chinese hill uh, gets turned into commercial forestry. Who's taking the initiative? How do they construct uh, the contractual relationship? How does it function? So as I understand it, what happens starting around the 12th century and really escalating after about 1500 is that landowners recognized that they could make money by planting trees. But planting trees offers some complexities that planting grain crops or fiber crops does not. Um, for one thing, trees are not annual. And so you have to plan for making an investment in something, an investment of labor, an investment of the money to buy the land that is not going to mature for 30, 40, 50 years or longer. Um, another complication is that forestry takes a huge amount of labor at the beginning of the tree planting and at the end of, of the process when the trees are logged. But in between, it requires very little oversight, very little um, workers in place. And so there was the question of how to handle this unusual labor situation as well as the long wait to see the gains from your investment. And so what Chinese landowners did is they took simple contracts and simple land deeds that had been used for agricultural land for hundreds of years and added clauses to them to, um, to create new situations that helped manage the forests, that helped with the needs specific to forestry. Um, the most important of these was they developed a shareholding mechanism where both people who contributed money towards buying a plot for, foresting, uh, for, for forestry and people who contributed labor by planting trees on that plot would, re would receive shares in the eventual timber harvest. And then the other thing that they did with these shares is that they traded them well in advance of the trees actually being cut down. And so this solved the second problem, which is how to deal with the long timeline between making an investment in planting trees and actually seeing that investment realized in the form of timber. And so um, people were able thereby to take a very simple contractual form and develop it to provide the types of rules and the types of sharing of risk and sharing of profits that were necessary in a sector where it took 30 to 50 years to realize the profits and that had this unusual uh, sort of labor arrangement. So if you were an extraterrestrial historian studying planet Earth, but uh, your sources basically stopped in the year 1600 uh, and somebody said, well, which part of the world is going to achieve 
uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, you might very well say, well, obviously, the part of the world that has uh, this kind of a system for uh, long run investment, where private property rights are, are central, uh, the state doesn't play more than a, a, a night watchman role. Uh, and uh, a, a crucially, uh, there's a kind of financial innovation going on alongside uh, the agricultural innovation. But of course, we know that that's not what happened and that this turned out not to be a kind of on-ramp to uh, more sustained uh, and sophisticated forms of investment, but actually a system that ran into the sand, if that's the appropriate uh, metaphor. D tell us why this didn't lead to greater things for the Chinese economy, because on paper, it sounds like quite a a, a potentially uh, fruitful system of organizing uh, uh, forestry and a rather more appealing one, certainly from a kind of free markets perspective, than what was going on in Prussia at that time where the state played a dominant role. So I think that there are largely two things. Um, so one is that there were never, there was never a central clearinghouse developed for these shares. And so it remained fundamentally local, frequently within an individual large family organization. And so what was essentially a primitive type of futures market never developed the features um, that would distinguish a more fully developed futures market in the modern period. Um, I think another major barrier to this was that the state um, in China was generally opposed to, um, to many forms of, finance, of financial manipulation not just manipulation, but you know, uh, financial mechanisms, securities. And so not so much in the case of forests, but with where there were these types of futures markets with more money involved in them, um, the state intervened to basically cut that off. They were not interested in a separate power center developing that could challenge the state. And so they were very uh, suspicious of any form of private finance, but at the same time, unwilling to develop um, a centralized fiscal apparatus for the state itself. One of the many things I learned from your talk uh, was that the famous treasure fleet of Admiral Chang He was made out of these uh, uh, commercially raised uh, furs uh, with only the masts, the really huge pieces of wood being provided by the earlier uh, natural forests. Uh, let, let me conclude by asking you a very broad question, perhaps an unreasonable one. Um, I'm, by training a European historian, I remember being quite excited when environmental history began uh, in my field in around the 1980s, uh, when German historians started to think about the historical significance of, of woods uh, in German history, a time when acid rain was causing large scale uh, dying off of, of German trees. I wonder what the cultural significance of, of woods is in, in the long run of Chinese history and how this shift from the natural to the commercial to the environmental, uh, environmentally ravaged state, how, how that's influenced the way the Chinese think about forests? Yeah, so there's, this is a really fascinating question. I, I think like in many parts of the world, uh, forests um, before the development of commercial forestry were sites that people both venerated as somehow sacred. Um, often trees were used as sort of altars um, for the gods of the earth, for the gods of the soil, but also forests were seen as places where demons or unruly spirits might, um, might dwell. And so one of the things that happens with the development of commercial forestry is that the forests lose some of their mystery. And um, a lot of the demons that are present in the forests in the earlier literature start to disappear and forests become much more banal. At the same time, some aspects of this veneration of forests persists in, in the tradition of feng shui, of sort of Chinese geomancy, which I think um, many people in Europe and America think of as a way that you reorganize your room um, to attract good luck, but it's also very much about the organization of landscape and which, how to organize 
um, human habitation within the landscape, but also what sites are appropriate for protection and veneration. And in many cases, these are sites that have ancient trees, that have graves, that have temples, or that are what we would now consider ecologically significant sites because they have a river course running through them, because they're prone to erosion or things like this. And so um, feng shui forests are carved out of these commercial forests as sites of veneration and protection, even as the rest of the forest becomes um, much more part of sort of banal commercial affairs. And this lasts more or less until the 20th century when feng shui is targeted by modernizers in China as a vestige of, um, of the past, a superstition that is getting in the way of progress. And so in some ways, maybe some of the, the good or beneficial aspects of feng shui, the protection of ecologically significant sites um, are thrown out, uh, you know, the baby is thrown out with the bathwater, so to speak, um, with the aspects of superstition that are getting in the way of things like developing uh, coal mines and railroads, which feng shui was actually a barrier to. Um, and it's really only been in the last 20 or 30 years that um, both some of these more sacred aspects of forests in Chinese culture have reemerged, feng shui has reemerged, um, and also something of an environmental protection movement in China. Um, in some ways, if we think of, of something like the acid rain events in Germany or the publication of Silent Spring in the United States, um, the, the turning point in China may have been the 1998 Yangtze River floods, which were incredibly destructive and caused, oh, I don't know how many billions of dollars of, of damage. And so the government stepped in and said, that's enough. And it's time to reforest these regions and to prevent the types of runoff and erosion that caused these catastrophic damages. Um, and that goes alongside other things that have been happening with other forms of pollution and a more popular environmental movement. But increasingly, China is being reforested. It's this transition that we see in many states as they enter um, a sort of later stage of modernity as their own um, populations are getting wealthy and are demanding um, nicer environments to live in. And so much of China's timber demand has actually now been displaced to the Russian Far East and to Southeast Asia. Well, as a Scotsman uh, who grew up as, as Scotland uh, entered a period of, of rapid uh, commercial reforestation, uh, I found a great deal in this uh, book to enjoy and, and to learn from. Uh, so Ian, thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and sharing your insights into not only Chinese environmental history, but Chinese economic uh, and political and even cultural history. The book, uh, once again, is Fur and Empire, The Transformation of Forests in Early Modern China, and the author, uh, Ian Miller. Ian, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Neil.